I just heard that you can throw salt over your shoulder. It said it originated from like like the enemy was there and you could blind them with your salt, but I don't get it. What happens if you find a floor and dig clover? That's good, right? I don't know, it's never got me any money. The number 13. Fingers crossed. Jinx. Hey, this guy's made 98 free throws in a row. Hey, this guy's made 25 field goals over 50 yards in a row. <gasps> don't say that, he's in this now. I don't, I don't believe in that. Sports are the worst. Sports are by far, and I think baseball, by, those guys have so many rituals. You know there was a famous baseball player that had to have chicken before every game. There's like, what, 162 games? I don't think that's good for you. The same meal every time. Or he thought he was gonna be unlucky and play back. Other people have lucky socks. There's people that won't wash their socks. <laughs> we all know who Serena Williams is one, because she's doing well in a tennis tournament. It said that she wore the same socks the whole time. She just believes, well, I don't know, it might work, so I'm gonna do it. There's a baseball player, no, no kidding, no cap, kids, sorry, that brushed his teeth between every inning because that's what he thought was lucky. It's crazy. You ever see some pretty funky, like, baseball hitters at the plate, like, People do that with their free throws for basketball. It's five dribbles, step this way, step that way, go like this. I don't know. One baseball player literally wore five pairs of socks every time he played because he thought that would help him. You guys know I don't make stuff up here, right? Just, I could, it would be fun but I don't. This last one, and I'm sorry I have to talk about it in church, but it's a, it's a baseball, I heard it more than once, and I looked it up again just to make sure it's real, and I think it still happens. There's people that are so superstitious, and baseball use your hands and dig calluses and stuff, that a lot of them believe that if you get a cut, or a callus, or if you want to harden up your hands to make them tough, they pee on their own hands. <laughs> Look it up. I don't make this stuff up. They do it. And one went even far to say is like, if I believe something will work, I'll have all my teammates sign a list and they can participate too. Because it's like a superstitious type, you can't think that's real. But it's super, people will try anything if they think it might work because they're that superstitious. You know who else does things like that? Sports dads. I'm a sports dad. I don't know, I'm not as bad as some of them, but they're like, well, we're gonna sign you up for this. We're gonna get you private lessons. We're gonna sign you up for hoop tech. You're gonna do this, you're gonna do basketball in the fall and the winter and the spring and in the summer. And then you're gonna do baseball in the winter and the summer and in the fall. And I'm gonna sign you up for this thing and we're gonna travel to Pennsylvania and you're gonna spend $2,000 to be on this team. And I think it's gonna help you. If, if there's any chance it's gonna help their kids, they're gonna do it all. They're not gonna blink. They're gonna get an extra job. And they're gonna do whatever it takes for their kid. That's what sports dads do. Sometimes they yell, sometimes they're quiet, sometimes they yell at their kid, sometimes they yell at other people, sometimes they're quiet. But they will do anything if they think it will work. Anything. Dads in general, I'm not trying to make anyone teary, not just sports, will do pretty much anything for their kids. Because sometimes we're like, eh, I can't cook, I'm not good at this, whatever, but I'll do whatever it takes for my kid. I will. Um, it's kind of a funny joke. So last night, I don't bring up names because I don't want anybody to feel bad. Aaron took one of our kids to their first <coughs> concert at Rocket Mortgage Fieldhouse. And I was going to go, but I wasn't here all week, and so I had to get my message ready and stuff. <laughs> I know, it's a big joke. I had to get it ready. And so we decided she would go. But then I'm like, she didn't want to drive and park downtown. I'm like, well, I guess I could take you and then I could like go park somewhere at work and then pick you up when you're done. And then I'm like, well, then two other kids are sitting at home. Like, 
maybe we should go like sit somewhere and watch the Ohio State game while I work and wait for them. I thought this was a great idea. Yes. And I guess they were placing bets behind my back on whether I was going to be up all night again finishing my message because I didn't have time to finish it. And I was like, what do you mean? I got a plan. I already started. I started in the car on the way back from Gatlinburg, Tennessee. I'm working on my message, writing on a piece of paper at old school. So I didn't have my computer. I was up all night getting the message ready. But I would rather be with my family and my kids. I would do anything. And if she didn't want to drive there and the other one wanted to go to the concert, whatever, I was going to make it happen. Because that's what dads do, right? We may be bad at a lot of stuff, but we're going to be the dumb one who stays up all night because our kids want to do something. And I'm okay with that. This has been a great series that, for me of learning from God, and this has been a horrible one. Like, I don't think I went to bed before 3 o'clock on a Saturday night. That was the earliest. But I wouldn't change a thing because I'm a dad. And that's what I do. And if everybody's in the living room sitting there, I'm not going to go start to work. I'm going to wait a little longer. I didn't say it was on my phone playing solitaire. No, that would be my dumb fault. That's not a dad thing. That's a human being thing. I mean, if I can spend time with my family, I'm going to do it. That's, I'm a dad. That's what I do. And so even though it was pretty stupid last night, I admit, like, that plan was probably a bad plan from the get-go. Dads can't live with them. Can't live without them. Just kind of that way. And I'm sorry if later, if, like, I'm not a very emotional person, but if I see a movie where there's, like, a kid and something bad happens to him, I'm like, I'm not going to tear up. <laughs> and some of you are going to connect to this one in a way because you have kids and you've done things for them and you've tried to do things for them and you've failed doing things for them and you've succeeded in everything in between. And that's what this is about. I'm not going to get emotional on purpose, but it's just what it is for your kids. If you don't have kids, sometimes you have a neighbor kid. You know, I mean, everybody has something that's like that that they can relate to. So there's a story in the Bible about a dad, and this one's called, I call it Desperate Dads. We're looking at the voices of the past, and of course we did David, we did Solomon, we did Mary and Martha. I'm calling this dude Desperate Dad in the New Testament. He's in Mark chapter 9, 14 through 29 is where I'm taking this from. Um, I'm going to give you a little lead up to it. So right before the story happens is this thing called the transfiguration of Jesus. And I, don't worry, I, I've heard of that. I'm like, I think I know what that is, but I'm not sure. All it was is Jesus and his disciples, he took three of them, Peter, James, and John, and he left everyone in the crowds, and he went up on the mountain. And they're like, okay, we're going to hang out with Jesus on the mountain. We'll probably, we'll probably pray or something. This is cool. And then what happened? As soon as they got on the top of the mountain, Jesus was transfigured before their very eyes. It says his clothes became radiant, exceedingly white. And then all of a sudden, Elijah and Moses appeared and were talking to Jesus. And if you don't know the Bible very well, Elijah and, Elijah and Moses are dead for a long time. There they are talking to Jesus. And they're like, oh, we thought this was going to be like a prayer meeting. Now he turns all white and bright, and he's talking to Elijah and Moses, and I don't know what's going on. And then a cloud appears, and a voice comes out of it. And they're like, this can only be God. And he says, this is my son. Listen to him. We can read that story and be like, that's not, so what? But I'm pretty sure I'd be, I'd be hiding under a rock. <laughs> Then, boom, all of a sudden, it was only the four of them again. And then they came back down the mountain. I almost guarantee you they did not understand what happened. They thought it was very, how could you not think it was awesome and beautiful and like a moment with God and like this amazing thing, but they still couldn't understand it. That's what happened right before the story that we're reading in Mark 9, 14 through 29. It's a little bit of a story here, but it's, don't tear up for me now. When they came to the disciples, they saw a great crowd around them and some scribes arguing with them. 
When the whole crowd saw him, they were immediately overcome with awe, and they ran forward to greet him. He asked them, what are you arguing about with them? Someone from the crowd answered him, teacher, I brought you my son. He has a spirit that makes him unable to speak. And whenever it seizes him, it dashes it down, and he foams and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. And I asked your disciples to cast it out, but they could not do so. He answered them, you faithless generation, how much longer must I be among you? How much longer must I put up with you? Bring him to me. They brought the boy to him, and when the spirit saw him, immediately threw the boy into convulsions, and he fell on the ground and rolled about, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. It has often cast him into the fire and into the water to try to destroy him. But if you are able to do anything, have pity on us and help us. And so Jesus said, if you are able, all things are done for the one who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out, well, I believe then, help my unbelief. Which is a weird statement. When Jesus saw that the crowd came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, You spirit that keep this boy from speaking and hearing, I command you, come out of him, and never enter him again. After crying out and convulsing him terribly, it came out. The boy was like a corpse, so that most of them said, Ah, I think he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he was able to stand. When he had entered the house, his disciples asked him privately, Why could we not cast it out? He said to them, this kind can only come out through prayer. you got to put yourself in the shoes of the dad. The desperate dad. See, there's a contrast here. The four people, Jesus and the three disciples, went up to the mountain and they had this great holy experience. It was beautiful. It was this personal, religious, spiritual experience. And then they come back down the mountain, and they are back to need and suffering, because that's what's down there. See, this is the problem. We seek those beautiful and personal and spiritual experiences. But if they don't connect to the need that's down below, it's missing something. Lots of people have a great experience and say, I'm so in love with God because of what happened. It's like a spiritual high. But then they have no relationship with the need of others. There's a disconnect. It makes our spiritual experience in a vacuum. It's up there, it happens with God, and then down here there's all these hurting people that need. The difference is, is Jesus always, every single time, made the connection between the two. And got it done. Always. Now we have a desperate dad. Son from childhood. There was a spirit in him. Um, that's a little harder for us to understand than these days. There was a spirit in him, it says, that made him unable to speak, throws him to the ground, foams at the mouth, grinds his teeth, becomes rigid, has convulsions, throws him into fire or water trying to kill him. Here's a dad watching that day after day after day after day. And he sees Jesus can you help me? Help me if you can. And of course, Jesus says, well, if you believe, of course. That's for dad. He probably doesn't know anything about Jesus other than he's healing people. And Jesus says, if you believe, you can. And he's like, okay, I believe. Help my unbelief. I'll do anything. Tell me, whatever it is, I'll do it. Now this could mean a lot of things. He could have meant, please change my unbelief to belief. He could have meant, help me want this faith or belief that you're talking about. And while you're doing it, please help my child. And he could have, he could have just meant, help me in spite of my lack of faith. Because he said right there, I believe, help my unbelief. He said, help, help my child anyway. Please, I'm desperate. These are all things I promise you a desperate dad would say to help his child. We don't have to pick it apart. We don't have to be like, well, what did he mean? Did he mean this? Did he mean that? No. These are all things that if you were in the same situation, you'd be like, I'll do whatever you tell me. If you tell me I have to believe this, I believe it now. I'll do it. All things a desperate dad would do. A desperate parent. I just, this just happens to be a dad. Let's be clear here. 
even if I was skeptical, I would do it. I would do it. If you told me right now that for the rest of the sermon, I could stand on my head to give the sermon, and if I succeeded, that my other three kids would go to college for free someday. No matter how much I thought that was baloney, I would try. Because I would do anything for my kids. There's not a rational bone in my body that believes it, but I would say, I believe! Help my unbelief. I'm going to do it. I'm going to try it. I'll do anything. I will try. We've talked about the last three weeks questions for the voice in the past, like what you would ask them. This week, I'm going to talk about questions a voice would maybe ask, like what the dad would ask besides what we heard, because this is a desperate dad, and I want to know what he would ask. And so one of the one of the questions, and this, this is real, you heard what was going on when Jesus came down. He would say, he could say, my son is suffering, and you scribes and disciples are standing there just arguing. You're arguing for hours and hours and hours, and my son is still suffering. What could you possibly be arguing about that's so important? See, it started with the scribes who wanted to discredit everything Jesus did. They were arguing with the disciples, saying, ha ha, you couldn't even exercise that spirit from him. How ridiculous and insensitive was the father sitting right there? Ha ha, you said you could help him. Ha <laughs> ha, you can't. Must not be who you said he was. And there's desperate dad listening to the whole thing. We would never do that, right? The history of the church has a lot of bad stories. Too many times the church in the rest of the world has come face to face with appalling need, like desperation. But we're only preoccupied with discussion about the problem. We had slavery in our country. And most of the denominations and churches just said, well, we don't want to upset the commerce system. We're just going to leave that one alone. Proud to say that our denomination did not do that. And that's one of the reasons why we exist. But it happened, and I'm sure we did a lot of other things that were stupid. There were wars fought in the name of Christ to convert people against their will. If that's not tone deaf, I don't know what it is. Before we, we, we talk too much about the past, now it's political, right? We all talk, we all tell everyone where we stand on issues, and we choose sides. But no one does anything, except maybe vote. We call that doing something. If you don't vote, this is how the world's going to go. If that person gets in, this is how the world's going to go. You better be on this side. I can't believe you believe that. I can't believe that. Meanwhile, there are people that need things and are hurting and need Jesus and both sides are using them as pawns just to argue over them and get their personal action. We're no better in the church. I'm not even picking on either side. We have people from all sides, in the middle, upside down. We have them all in the church, and I'm glad because I learn from everybody that's different from me. And I and rejoice at that and I embrace it because they have a different viewpoint. And I can learn it from anybody. But when we keep talking about stuff and don't help anybody, even something you don't agree with. If those people need help, you should be helping them. Not talking about why they shouldn't get help because they don't agree with you or they're like this or they're like that. You should be helping them. We should be helping them. I should be helping them. But we're bad at that. We just talk. So I ask you today, what are we discussing? What are we discussing that's missing the point? What are we toned up because we're just talking about it and not helping people? I don't know what it is. I know that if we were in that situation, if you took that boy and that dad and plopped them to right now, I guarantee there would be discussions about, well, I don't know if there's a demon. Maybe he's just mentally ill. I don't really believe in possession. Uh, maybe he's just lazy and doesn't want to work. Maybe he just wants attention and he's doing it on purpose. I guarantee people would say those things to try to get a vote from one side or the other. And it's that. 
I'm not excluding myself from it. I would try not to, but I can't promise you anything. Vote for me, and this will never happen again to another child. Do you know the child's name? Is it sat beside you? Jesus always makes the personal connection first before he teaches, before he does anything else. Always. We need to try to do the same as much as we can. That's what I'm learning from this dad. And I'm putting myself in the dad's shoes thinking those people over there arguing and doing whatever. And I'm like, that is terrible. I can't imagine being that dad. So that's why he asked that question. The next one, and there's, there's only two, is this is the first thing I would ask if I was that dad and I didn't know Jesus, I didn't know God. Why can't you help me? Why can't you help me? I saw all these miracles, I saw all these things, and here's my son, and you couldn't help me. Why can't you help me? You believe in God. You seem super spiritual. Why can't you offer me anything meaningful that helps me, anything that I need? And so that's a good question. And so I ask you, why were the disciples powerless? Why could they do all this other amazing stuff and this one they couldn't? What did Jesus say? He said, oh, faithless generation. Here's the thing. He wasn't talking about the dead. He was talking about him too, but he's talking about the disciples as well. You guys are pretty faithless. You saw all these miracles. I walked on water. I turned a couple of loaves of bread and fish and feeding 5,000 or more, and now you can't do this? So then that brings the question. Why can't you help me? Do we really believe that Jesus is truth and he's life? We're like, yeah, of course I believe that. Do we believe he's the way to salvation? That he's the revelation of God? Yeah, we believe that. Do we believe he's the answer to today's problems? Oh, I don't know. Why will roll? We definitely don't believe that as much as we believe two plus two is four and that the world's round. Which at one time we did believe. But we still believe that more sometimes than God can solve today's problems. We just don't seem to believe that very much. Why can't you help me? Look at my son. When we have a problem, let's be honest, we try to solve them the same way that the rest of the world does. The people that don't even believe God does. More money, work harder, use your connections, maybe cheat if we have to. But in our world, especially in America, we don't have to rely on God to make it through to the next day. At least we don't think we do. So that's not how we think the Bible works. We don't think it has anything to say with about today. It's nice and we believe it. But that's why we don't have anything to offer the world. We solve our problems the same way that they do. We try the same things. Why would they think... Unless we have more money than them and more power, why would they think we have anything to offer? <coughs> That's why we can't help. That's why he said, why can't you help me? And they're like, I don't know, we did all this amazing stuff. I, we tried. We're not offering them anything new that they don't already have. They can't do it themselves. Of course, what did Jesus say? It's like the Sunday school answer. It, it, the answer wasn't Jesus because Jesus was there. So he said, eh, prayer. Oh, I never thought of that. Never thought of that. Sounds ridiculous if you were there. Because the dad had to think, well, did these disciples not pray hard enough? Did they not pray long enough? What's the deal? Jesus said the answer is prayer. And they clearly tried. And they seem like super spiritual dudes. Why didn't it work? Here's the problem. Prayer, the big word prayer, is not a moment of conversation. Because that's what we kind of view it as. Prayer is a life connection with God. The goal of prayer is to be permanently connected with God. It doesn't mean you won't mess up. It doesn't mean that sometimes it won't get interrupted. But that's supposed to be our goal. A life connection with God. It opens the door constant prayer to communion with God so he can come into our very souls so that we live, eat, breathe, and rely on him. I know it sounds deep, 
but that's what prayer is supposed to be. It's supposed to be communion with God. It's a deep, constant connection. And then when you have that, or when you strive for it, and even get it sometimes, just a little bit, it changes things. Sometimes it solves our problems. Sometimes it makes us forget about our problems. Sometimes it makes us think about helping others instead of ourselves. We don't know what it is because it's God. That's what we have to offer. If you can offer a total stranger or someone in need this constant connection, this thing that you can't explain, that distracts you when you don't want to be distracted, but that does all these things, that's what we can offer that they don't already have. Now, well, I'm with you, man. I'll work just as hard as you. I'll try to make money. I mean, that's all. I'm not saying God doesn't want us to use human means to help people. He does. But without the part that they can't get on their own, without this prayer, this communion, this God that's bigger than everything else, all that stuff is just exactly what they can get themselves from anyone. See, in theory, we believe everything the Bible says. In practice, we often just decide to use everything that we normally do at our own disposal to, to solve our problems. I'm not pointing the finger at you. I say we. <clears throat> you know who didn't do that? Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You heard about the story of the fiery furnace? It, first of all, I suggest you read it. I can't do it justice. First of all, what was going to happen was they were in trouble. Because they wouldn't bow down to this false god. They're like, no matter what, and you say you're trying us, we're not going to bow down. And so they're like, no, not going to do it. And then they got in big trouble. And the king was so mad, he's like, I'm going to throw you in this fiery furnace. He throws someone in the furnace. I don't know. It's what he was going to do. What did they say? This is great. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered the king, O oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to present a defense to you in this matter. Uh, I don't know about that. I'm going to be thrown in the fire furnace, and I don't need to defend myself. But that's what they said. If our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire and out of your hand, O oh, let him deliver us. But if not, let it be known to you, O oh, king, that we will not serve your gods anyway, and we will not worship the golden statue that you have set up. They basically said, our God can, but if he chooses not to, we're still with him. That's belief. That's no matter what I believe. Wow. You know what that did to the king? He got really mad. He heated it up like seven times more or ten times more than they normally heat the furnace. I don't know how you do that. More coal, more wood, more everything. So much so that when the men had to take them into the furnace and throw them in, they burned up. The men that had to take them into the furnace. And if you read the story yourself, of course they all went in there, didn't burn up, didn't even smell like smoke, no, nothing. Because they said no matter what happens, we're with God, that's what we can offer. Put your money where your mouth is, prove it. He didn't, God, I don't know if God told them or not, but that's what they did. He said, this is what we believe. We're not even going to defend ourselves. Whatever happens, happens. Prove it. Can we get there? I don't know. That's a hard place to get. We believe all these amazing things, but we don't have to prove it. So do you really believe it? You know what the dad taught us? Be honest. It's okay to say, I believe, help my unbelief. What if God says, first of all, I don't think he necessarily talks to you this way. What if he says, you can go jump off of that cliff and I'm going to make you fly. And you'd be like, yeah, sure, sounds great. I believe it. And so you have to prove it, do you really believe it? You don't. With lots of things we say, no matter what happens, this is the Sunday school answer, no matter what happens, God loves us. He wants the best for us, and so whatever crappy things happen, at least we have that. That's nice. But until we have to prove it, it's just words. I promise you, those are not the things you want to say to people that are suffering with no way out. 
someone that has a child that there's no way out or it's hopeless, you don't want to tell them, well, it's okay, because God loves you. You're allowed to say something, but be very careful. What kind of hope do you have to offer that they don't already have? That's hard to get there. But that is truly what we can offer people. This, I'm going to back it up with my actions and the words are. That's what we can offer. That is something special to offer. And that's what this dad, desperate dad, taught me this week. We need to offer him something real that he can't find anywhere else because he's asking real dad questions that we would all ask. So I just pray that we can get there. Yeah, yeah. Hey, my team shine glow, might need blindfold, high key, I'm on, okay, can't leave my zone, worst Smith Christie's first kid, 15, no hope, it seems, still hope, big dreams, I refuse to settle, I want real change, even in the UK, it's still gang, sick of interviews, I'm hot, still came for the last time, Miles Minnick is a real name, I don't got a front, I don't got a stunt, slide through your church, we gon' turn that thing up, hit the smees with the team, and I'm tryna show the pastor, on the under, he gon' ask me how to do it after, We'll be headed, my soul got the glow embedded We taking over, I bet it, I'ma see it Cause I said it, if we don't, I'll admit it But I can see it's not winning, it's back to back Never ending, got an unlimited engine I'ma show out, show out I'ma show out, I'ma show out Stop acting like you don't know what I'm about I'ma show out, I'ma show out